Hey, this is Cam with Blackdale Studio, and this week I build an oversized desk from what I feel is one of the most underrated, beautiful, and occasionally affordable wood species there is. Stay tuned. This desk is essentially going to be a big, single slab, solid wood desk with kind of a hybrid live edge aspect to it. And since I'm not creative enough to visualize exactly what it would look like, or smart enough to use software to help me render it, I built these simple little templates to really just help me visualize what it's going to look like when it's all done. And I mentioned this is going to be oversized, so this will be around 72 by I think 34 inches when it's all said and done. But the slab, as you can see, is much bigger than that. So we actually have a little bit of freedom to choose exactly the best part we want to use for this desk. Anytime that I remove the live edge of a big wood slab like this, I get tons of comments from people that tell me that I just ruined the look of this big natural wood slab by removing that live edge. Conversely, anytime I make a live edge table, I get tons of comments from people that tell me that live edge is going to be a really dated style and I just made a very tacky table. And finally, anytime I add epoxy to anything, both sides like to pile on and tell me that I just ruined it by adding toxic chemicals to the natural wood. So I wanted to give a table for all sides to come together and hate in one place. So this is going to have straight edge, live edge, and a little bit of epoxy. I mentioned that I felt this was a very underrated wood, and the species that I'm using here is elm. And I think part of the problem with the image of elm is it's a very boring sounding name. It's like being named Bob, and you don't see any male models named Bob. They're always named Fabio or something. And the same for wood species. You're named Bubinga or Rosewood or Bastone Walnut. They all have a very fancy name, but elm. It just sounds so boring. So I think we need to work on rebranding it. We need to come up with a new name for elm that still would apply. It's like the sea bass used to be named the Patagonian toothfish, which is a ridiculous name and nobody would eat it. But as soon as they rebranded it sea bass, it's at every restaurant. So if we can come up with a better name for elm, I think that would really help the image. I should say this isn't just ordinary elm. This is elm that has a good bit of burl to it. And the burl is where you get the most amazing grain, the most amazing color. It's just kind of a pain to clean up, whereas these normal live edge sections are really easy to clean up with something like this Porter Cable Restore. But the burl sections are where you have to get really creative with all your dental tools and dull chisels and try to dig it out while still maintaining the natural shape of these kind of crags. This isn't going to be an epoxy table, so to speak, but there is a rather large, rather noticeable, rather in the way, but really cool natural crack that runs about a quarter of the length of the table. And so, what I'm doing here is I am sealing it with clear epoxy because we're going to be filling that void with a jet black epoxy and the clear is going to prevent any staining on this light wood from that black epoxy. And also a question I get all the time is why do I always use black epoxy? Why don't I try to match the wood color a little bit more closely? And in my opinion, black is actually the most discreet color you can use because a lot of these woods have really natural black streaks in them. And also it kind of resembles more of just a shadow than anything. So if you want a really discreet void filled, I recommend using black epoxy. In the past, I've had good luck sealing small cracks like this with this Gorilla Tape or a good quality duct tape. The only thing you need to remember is the epoxy needs to be relatively dry. So I'll come back and do those later. As far as the top, I rarely do this caulk trick, but I am doing it here because I want to maximize the thickness of this slab. So this is going to allow me to overpour that epoxy slightly without it running all over the table. This crack that I'm filling isn't very wide, but it's pretty deep. These slabs are about two and a quarter inches thick right here. And with that overfill, we're probably close to two and a half inches. So instead of using something like a tabletop epoxy, I'm using the super clear epoxy deep pour resin. And this is going to do a couple things. This is first off going to allow me to pour the entire crack in one shot. So I don't have to come back and do layers. Second, it's going to really, really reduce the bubbles. It's going to be essentially a perfectly clear pour, whereas if I did the tabletop epoxy, there's always going to be little micro bubbles that'll need addressing. Speaking of my friends slash sponsors over at Super Clear Epoxy, I have started the wildly premature process of planning for my million subscriber giveaway, which, first of all, is absolutely preposterous to think that I would have ever got to this point. So thank you all so much for coming along for the journey. I genuinely, genuinely never, ever thought this was remotely possible. So everybody out there that subscribed, thank you guys so much for coming along for the journey. As for the rest of you freeloaders, you guys are cool too. I do appreciate the views anyway, but I wanted to do something pretty big for my million subscriber giveaway. So 
one of the things Super Clear Epoxy is donating is like a $2,200 epoxy package that we'll give away to several winners. I'm going to be making furniture to donate. I'm going to be donating my consultations. Oliver is donating a spiral head benchtop planer. Gobi Walnut's going to be donating a wood slab. We're going to have even more sponsors. So I will include a link to my email signup. I do not know all the specifics of how I'm going to do this giveaway. So if you sign up for the email list, I will send you all the details as I learn them. After I removed as much of this caulk as I could and let it cure for a couple of weeks, I was ready to take it into my favorite industrial shop in Portland, Creative Woodworking Northwest. And here's a little tip for you. When you start handling these pieces, especially after they get surfaced, keep them on one of these styrofoam sheets from Home Depot. They only cost like $7 and they'll really prevent any dings or dents you might get. When you pull into Creative Woodworking, it's kind of a free-for-all because there's no dedicated unloading zone. Both of us here are actually parked in a no parking zone. And since we got here at the same time, I helped him offload his stuff so that way I could get the cart up to the back of my truck to offload my slab. However, at this point, he realized he locked the keys in the truck so he actually couldn't get in there. So we were kind of stuck. So I had to make do. And luckily, I didn't have any bigger table than I do this week because this is about all I could carry by myself. The guys at Creative Woodworking are super easy to work with and they only charge 75 bucks for 30 minutes or $150 per hour to use all of these incredible tools. The only thing they say is don't run any metal through the tools. And you can see there Thor hit the emergency stop and fished out what looks to be a little piece of aluminum. It's like a little aluminum cap. And I didn't recognize it. I'm gonna blame it on someone else, but Thor gave me the disappointed look there because mm, might've been mine, but either way, Thor caught it and I didn't get charged the $150 fee if they happen to hit metal in one of your projects. A few weeks ago, I drew a fair amount of attention to a certain part of a desk that resembled a certain part of the female anatomy and got a fair amount of comments of people telling me how embarrassed I should be and how juvenile I was. And I can assure you that will never happen again. Normally, I just square things up when I get home from creative woodworking with my track saw, but because they have a 30 minute minimum and we only spend about 10 or 15 minutes on the planer, I went over to the Martin sliding table saw and squared everything up because they could do it in about three minutes and it is just as good as anything I could do with my track saw at home. Probably even better. Whatever table I'm building, whether it's a big epoxy table or a single slab desk like this or a solid wood book match like I've done in the past, as soon as I get it surfaced, I like to get it home and start on the C-channel process to give it as little opportunity as possible for it to warp and cup on me. And there's a few reasons why they don't traditionally build out of these big single slabs like this. They're actually one of the worst ways to build a table. People think this is the easiest way and there are aspects of it that are easy, but it lends itself to problems down the road if you don't take certain precautions. And one of those precautions is doing something like these C channels. And always, always, always I get asked, what do the C channels do? Will they prevent it from cracking or splitting or all these questions? And all they really do is they help keep it flat. Whereas a traditional table is generally made from a number of boards glued up in a particular grain orientation that will help assist in keeping that table flat. Also, most tables have something called an apron. So that will also assist in keeping it flat. These single slabs or the book match or the live edge tables, they don't really have any of that. So these C channels assist in keeping it flat the same way that apron does or that grain orientation in the glue up. I need to be really careful and stop talking about panel glues at this point because I'm sure I'm going to say the wrong thing if I keep going because those really aren't my wheelhouse. I know a little bit about them. I've done some of them, but if I was going to do one right now, I'd probably get on YouTube and look up something like the Wood Whisperer and I actually know he has a good video on that. So I'll include a link to his video in the description below if you want some more information on a traditional panel glue up. When I used to recess these mounting plates for my table bases, I used to build a jig for each and every table base. And then I realized that was a complete waste of time. So what I do now is I put my table leg exactly where I want it. And then I just surround it with this quarter inch melamine or acrylic or both. And I fasten it down with double side tape. And I give myself about a quarter inch buffer all around. And this allows me enough room for the seasonal wood movement of the slab to move around that table base. Cause you don't really want it locked in place and just a perfect CNC fit. Cause that could actually cause your wood to crack over time. I mentioned this in my last video, but apparently not everybody that watches one video of yours watches every single video that you make. So I'll mention it again. And that's when you're done working on your table before you finish it, cover it with something like this painter's plastic, because that's going to prevent one side from absorbing moisture from the air 
and causing it to warp or twist a little bit. After you have finished on both sides, then you don't need to do it. But before that, I like to cover it with the plastic pretty much every single night that I'm done using it. I never like to ask for a subscription in the first part of a video because I feel like even if I was able to trick someone into hitting subscribe in that first minute, there's a really good chance that those same people would be unsubscribed by the time they got to like minute two and they realized they don't like me talking this much. So if you've been able to make it to minute 10 with me talking the entire time, I, th I think you're ready. I think you should just hit that subscribe button. If you actually think that I've earned it, I would appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button right now. It genuinely does help me out. And like I mentioned earlier, we're doing the million subscriber giveaway if I do actually hit it, which I should by the end of the year, hopefully, cross my fingers. So if you want to be a part of that, I would really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button right now. This slab did have quite a few cracks in it, but the only one I was really worried about was this one right near the end. And so I'm adding a single solitary bow tie, and this is going to be on the underside. I don't think there'd be anything wrong aesthetically is putting these bow ties on top of the desk, but I think this was going to be a little bit cleaner, and I got the feeling my client really wanted a nice, clean, smooth, single slab top with no inlays or bow ties. And I know a lot of you guys out there agree, because I got a lot of comments of people asking me, why can't you put bow ties on the underside? And the question is, you absolutely can. Some people just like the looks of them on top. So this one's going to be in the underside. I'm using epoxy here. There's no real reason not to use wood glue. I do think the epoxy works a little bit better when you're doing something that isn't clamped, but wood glue would have worked just as well. In my last video, I mentioned I've been working on better ways to clean up my live edge without really marring in the surface. And these nylon brushes actually work really well. They're pretty cheap. I think they're from Amazon. I'll include a link to them in the description below. But a lot of you guys actually had some really good ideas. I had never even heard of dry ice blasting, which sounds awesome. And it also sounds really expensive, but if you watch my videos, you know I'm not adverse to expensive. So Thanks to everybody and their ideas for helping me clean up my live edge. One of the most frustrating parts of working with epoxy is filling these little micro pits. You can see there, I filled them the best I possibly could with CA glue, hit them with the sander, and then they come back. And this is what always happens. It's so frustrating. So I do have a solution for you. It's a little counterintuitive, and that's actually to make the holes bigger because what happens is those little pits kind of form an air pocket and they won't allow that CA glue to penetrate. So I carve out a little groove and then I fill them with just regular clear CA glue. And believe it or not, the clear actually matches the black just perfectly, then hit it with the sander and those micro bubbles will disappear finally. I just watched that Bob Ross documentary on Netflix and I never knew that he did those paintings in real time. So if it was a 28 minute episode, he did the entire painting start to finish in less than 28 minutes, which is absolutely unbelievable. And the reason I bring this up is I wanted to show you guys a few clips of just how much time this takes me. This is not Bob Ross time. This is highly, highly edited. This takes me hours, if not days, just to fill these imperfections and sand it. I wish I could do it in 30 minutes. I'm not that good. Maybe I will be someday. But for now, I want you guys to know that if your project takes you hours or days, that's not unusual. This is normal. This is at least normal for me. And not all of us can be Bob Ross. My sanding progression starts at 100, then I go to 120, 150, and I end at 180 grit. And in between each and every grit, I spritz with water or quote, water pop it to help raise the grain, which in theory gives you a smoother finish in the end. And I haven't done the scientific tests on that, so I can't say for sure, but I do feel like it makes a difference. And from there, then I can start my actual finishing process. Over the past several months, I've started using the Black Forest Ceramic Top Coat, and I feel like that's caused a little bit of confusion to my finishing process, so I wanted to kind of clear that up. The Black Forest Ceramic is more of like, think of it like a car wax. It's not the paint, it's the wax. It's not even the clear coat, it's just the wax. And what I'm applying here is the finish. This is what we would consider the paint, if you will. This is Rubia Monaco. It's a hard wax oil. It's a great finish. I've been using it for a couple of years now. Very durable, very natural finish, but it's completely unrelated to the Black Forest Ceramic. And what I do here is I add two coats of the Rubio Monaco across a couple days. I'm only going to show the first coat because I feel like I always show the second coat. And you guys can watch one of my other videos that I'm happy to link in the description below. So the Rubio Monaco is the bulk of the finish. That's what's going to give the color. That's going to be what gives most of the protection. After this Rubio Monaco dries for seven days, which is just the normal cure time of Rubio Monaco, that's when I can start with the Black Forest Ceramic. And the ceramic can go over, I believe, any finish, whether it's a polyurethane or a lacquer 
or an Osmo or a different type of finish like that, so long as it's completely cured. The reason, as I understand it, that you don't want to apply this Black Force Ceramic too early is that if you apply this on a finish that hasn't yet cured, you can actually seal it in and prevent that finish from ever actually curing. So I waited the full seven days, and as far as the application process, it is really easy. You just use your little applicator pad, you work in small sections until it starts to get kind of a rough, you start to feel the texture of it starting to pull on your little applicator pad, and then just a tiny spritz of water and let the weight of your hand pull off any excess. You're not really buffing it, you're not trying to remove too much. Just work it in with their little applicator pad until it starts to get kind of tough to work in, put a tiny spritz of water on a microfiber, and then just very lightly buff off any excess. And that is it, and it does add contrast, it adds depth, it adds a little bit of sheen to your tables, because it adds sheen, I make sure to hit the sides as well. I don't do the underside. I don't think that's necessary, but I might change that eventually. But yeah, it is a really easy, really nice product that gives you a fair amount of protection because I have done some water tests and it remarkably, remarkably beads up water compared to just the Rubio. I did a quick test fit of these legs by Flowy Line Design before I got it packed up for delivery. And I mentioned at the start of the video that Elm is occasionally affordable. And what I meant by that was it wasn't particularly affordable here, but it really wasn't that bad either. I paid $1,350 for that slab, which is kind of a fair retail price. It's just not a steal. Whereas I feel like you keep your eyes peeled. Sometimes you can get something like Elm for a little bit cheaper. Also, the finished cost of this desk was $6,500, which was a little bit less than I normally do. But they also ordered a dining table from me at the same time that's coming in hopefully just a few weeks. So I'll have a video on that as well. Also have a little sneak peek inside their house if you stick around till the end of the video. And here we go though, here is the finished Elm. I really, really like Elm. I love the light color. I love that burl corner. I like the crack. I like that I didn't use any bow ties for once. So all in all, I'm really, really thrilled with it. Every week I like to give a little bit of credit to people who make it all the way to the end of the video. So this week, start your question or comment with the item that you think would be the best possible gift for the million subscriber giveaway. Even if you don't wanna be a part of it, I would love your feedback. Thanks so much.